yes let's continue um so uh, we have covered galatians chapter 5 verses 1 to 15 and in uh, 15 verse 15 we have been told that we need to um you know express our love towards our fellow believers uh, because by doing that uh, we in fact find ourselves fulfilling the entire law so it's something that we need to do because now we are believers we have been uh, renewed by christ so now we have the ability to live in a new and different way so we should no longer be like the world uh, and no longer living according to worldly standards but now we have to live according to godly standards because now we have become children of god okay so um, so we have to start behaving like children of god so we have to make a conscious effort and so in uh, verses 16 to 23 he talks about this new effort which we should make as believers 16 to 23 is a lot of verses uh, but you know um, if we i'll just try to summarize the whole thing you know as um, quickly as possible because there is so much more to cover uh, so um, in verses 16 to 23 uh, this is mainly what is being said uh, paul is pointing out that there are two kinds of um, two sets of desires so the flesh is desiring one set of things and the Holy Spirit is desiring another set of things. And what the flesh desires is in opposition to what the Spirit of God desires. And obviously we all know, I mean, even the, even the people who are not believers, we all know that we should not be following the desires of the flesh because that is sinful. On the other hand, we should all be following the desires of the Spirit. That is what we should be obeying. That is what we should be fulfilling. So over here, Paul is making the point and saying, you know, if you guys are going to keep the Mosaic law and if you follow all of the Jewish rituals, that is not going to help you to uh, overcome the, the desires of the flesh. There's only one way that you're going to be able to, uh, you know, keep the desires of the, of the spirit. And that is only if you are walking by the Spirit and you are being led by the Spirit. So in verse 16, he says, so I say, walk by the Spirit and you will not gratify the desires. If you keep the Mosaic law, that will not help you from avoiding uh, the fleshly desires. If you're keeping the Mosaic law, that will not cause you to you know, uh, overcome your flesh. The only way you're going to overcome your flesh the only way you will actually be able to uh, be to please the Holy Spirit by doing what the Holy Spirit desires. The only way you're going to be able to achieve that is by walking by the Spirit. And in verse 18, he says, being led by the Spirit. Um, the main problem is that a person may be very, very sincerely keeping the Mosaic law, uh, but they have no control about the emotions on the inside like they you know we already used that example we talked about it uh, you know if you hate somebody uh, you can forcefully keep yourself from uh, hitting the person or killing the person but inside your heart you have no control about the for, uh, over the hatred which is roiling over there you are not able to make yourself love that person outwardly you may pretend but in, inwardly, you have no control over your emotions. That requires a work of the Holy Spirit. And so even people who are trying to keep the letter of the law, they are unable to keep the spirit of the law on their own. It is not something that we can be done on your own. And so he says, you need to start walking by the spirit, being led by the spirit. That is the only way you're going to fulfill the law. And he says in verse 18, he says, if you are led by the spirit, you are not under the law. And then he again uh, repeats that uh, in um, verse 23. He says, against such things, there is no law. So 
in Old Testament times, the people needed a guardian. They needed a tutor, someone who can keep them forcefully in line and make them listen. Because that's basically what a guardian and a tutor does with children. You know, So in back in those days, they would place all the kids under a guardian, under a tutor. And that master, that instructor, he would you know, keep them in line. He would use the rod. You know, he would be very strict with them. Uh, if, if they if they do anything wrong, he would punish them. And that way, by punishing them and by you know uh, giving them a beating whenever it is necessary, he would kind of imprint on their in inside their minds that bad bad living, sinful living is wrong. You need to honor God. You need to be do what is right. So he would try to use force. The guardian, the tutor, uses force to kind of you know punish the people and scare them and frighten them into being good so that at least temporarily for a little while you know they will be good and slowly it'll begin they'll begin to realize oh um this is something difficult we can't do this on our own I, uh, how we wish we had a savior who could help us to actually obey the law and keep it you know so they were that realization would begin to dawn in their minds so all that was required for people who are uh, under the law but if you are being if you are walking by the spirit by the power of the holy spirit and you are being led by him you are sensitive to whatever he is saying you are immediately submitting and obeying each time he says something so if you are being led by the spirit and if you are walking by the power of the spirit then you don't need a guardian or a tutor all that's like old history you know you know when you were a child when you were in sin at that time, yes, you needed a guardian and a tutor. Um, you know, using that whole imagery that he uses for the Israelites, because uh, they, they were they were like children who had to be kept under a tutor. But now, now you are under the new covenant, and you have the power of the Holy Spirit. You have the leading of the Holy Spirit, and so if you follow that, then you don't even have to bother about having a guardian. You know, holding a stick over you. Because the Holy Spirit who is in you will enable you to keep, uh, you know, uh, his values, his standards. And by doing that, you automatically find yourself fulfilling the law. OK, so that's the argument which is being made over here. So he in, in verses 19, um, uh, uh, 20 and 21, he lists out a whole bunch of, uh, you know, sins. And he warns, he gives a warning in verse 21, and he says, you know, if you do these sinful things, you will not inherit the kingdom of God. In fact, you know, he's kind of addressing this uh, to the Judaizers and to the believers who are thinking that they should start practicing Judaism. He's telling them, these are all the very, very terrible sins. And, um, you know, if you if you do these sinful things, you will not inherit the kingdom of God. But in your own strength, by keeping the Mosaic law, it's not going to happen. You will end up breaking these rules. You will end up committing these sins. And you will not inherit the kingdom of God. So if you're serious about inheriting the kingdom of God, come under the Spirit of God. Place yourself under the Holy Spirit, who is given to you when you place your faith in Jesus Christ. So place your faith in Christ. Allow the Holy Spirit to take control of your life. Allow yourself to be led by him because then you will actually have the power to overcome all these terrible, terrible things which are mentioned in verses 19, 20, and 21. That's the only route to, you know, uh, to having a holy life. You cannot do this on your own. If you start being led by the Spirit, then the Holy Spirit will produce a fruit in you. OK, so he talks about the kind of fruit which the Holy Spirit will produce in you if you are walking by his power and by his strength. And um, uh, if you note over here, uh, it clearly talks about one single fruit which is produced in the person. OK, it's not talking about multiple fruits. It's talking about one single fruit. Um, um, It says the but the fruit of the spirit, 
okay one single fruit of the spirit is love joy peace so this is this one single fruit it's got a whole bunch of um of things inside it including love joy peace self control uh, um, uh, gentleness faithfulness all of that okay so what exactly is this fruit this fruit is literally and if you look at if you if you look at all those items which i mentioned over there you know faithfulness gentleness self control love joy peace it's literally the nature of god so he is saying if you allow yourself to be led by the spirit and if you are walking by the power of the spirit the spirit will produce the nature of god in you he will start making you christ like that's the whole goal of salvation right that each of us should become into the likeness of jesus christ himself so that will start happening you will literally start developing the nature of god the nature of jesus christ um because the spirit will empower you to make that happen from your side what you should do is cooperate and walk with him allow yourself to be led by him on a day to day basis be sensitive to what he is saying obey his instructions submit to him when he's correcting you know um, when he follow his guidance when he's trying to tell you how to go about it just follow him as you are doing that then one particular fruit will start growing in you what is that fruit that fruit is literally the nature of christ you will start moving in love you will start experiencing true joy there will be peace inside you you will become a faithful person who will be faithful to the lord you will be gentle in the way you treat your fellow believers you will have self control over yourself in every area of life so that this fruit of the very nature of christ will start being formed in you if you are allowing yourself to be uh, you know led by the spirit and then in uh, uh, verse 25 he you know he says since we live by the spirit let us keep in step with the spirit so um how do you keep in step with the spirit this is basically the same thing which is mentioned in your john 15 where jesus is saying abide abide in me because when you abide in me only then you will bear fruit okay so over there the wording that jesus uses is he says abide in me let the branch continue being attached to the vine because as long as the connection is strong between the branch and the vine that branch will be able to bear fruit and over here paul is using a different wording he's saying keep in step with the spirit so whether you're talking about abiding in the vine or whether you're talking about keeping in step with the spirit you're just basically saying the same thing you're saying stay connected to the lord on a continual basis the stronger you maintain your connection with him the more you will be able to bear fruit on the other hand if your connection to with, with him is very very weak that branch will not bear fruit so don't be out of step with the spirit keep in step with him abide in him uh, you know remain in him different wordings that you can use it all uh is necessary why because only then will you be able to bear fruit okay so john 15 and what galatians 5 is saying they both are in fact basically saying the same thing okay so um this is what we need to do and in verse 24 just going back to verse 24 there's one uh, you know um additional point that he is making over there those who belong to christ jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires so on a daily basis it is your responsibility to take the passions of your mind and the desires of your flesh and every day you take them to the cross and you nail them over there to the cross and say no i will not live according to no the evil passions of my mind i'm not going to live according to the fleshly desires of my body rather i will choose to be led by the spirit i will choose to walk by the power of the holy spirit i will choose to keep in step with the spirit and abide in christ so that uh, you know uh, christ will start you know bringing out his nature in me his love his joy his faithfulness his self control all of that will start uh, being demonstrated in my life okay so 
um, that is the whole you know um, summary of what is being taught over here. So against such things, it says in verse 23, against such things, there is no law. So a person who's living like this, they don't even need a guardian. They don't need, even need a tutor standing over them with over them with a stick. They are being led by the spirit. Uh, and so such people, they will find themselves fulfilling the entire law without even bothering about you know uh, cleaning the fungus in your house in a particular way and then washing your hands in a particular manner and and choosing the right kind of lamb and taking it to the temple to you know all those mosaic laws right from the way you scrub the wall the the fungus on your walls uh, to you know um, how you maintain hygiene inside the camp and oh they had all these laws and regulations uh, you know which they had to fulfill and um, we don't even need to be doing all that. We just simply need to be keep in step with the spirit. And as we are doing that, we will automatically find ourselves fulfilling the entire law. Why? Because the very nature of Christ is being formed in us. And it's, it, you know, it literally comes out in our words, in our actions. Uh, we are a new, you know, a new person. Um, maybe there are other aspects of this that we could talk about don't know whether we have time or not um very sad this will, there's so much doctrine and so much truth packed into these verses and um, don't know whether we really have the time to be you know uh, covering all of it okay this is something i really want to do because uh, you know um, we are talking, you know, it's verse 24, Galatians 5, 24, you know, so it says here, those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. We, we do it on a daily basis where we are crucifying these passions and desires on a daily basis, but we also have already done it. Okay. So this whole thing is taking us back to Romans chapter six, where it talks about, you know, getting crucified. And uh, then once you are crucified, because you are crucified, you start behaving like a person who has crucified by continuing to crucify on a daily basis. Okay, so um, that's the, the the this is directly linked to your Romans six uh, passage. Uh, so maybe we need to kind of at least look a little bit at that so that we'll have this a more complete understanding about this whole crucifying thing. Because you see, at the end of your of his uh, thing letter, uh, Paul again brings up that he talks about how he has been crucified to the world, and the world has been crucified to him, and he refers to him as, a, as a, himself as a new creation. So these are all things which are running through his mind even as he's writing these things. So I don't think we should just kind of you know um, skip over it. It's not correct. So if someone could please read out Romans chapter six. Verses six and seven. Yeah. We know that our old self was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing, so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. For one who has died has been set free from sin. Okay, so um, I mean, a lot of us are already familiar with this important doctrine, uh, but you know, just to clarify for those of us who may still have a few doubts about it, um, at that moment, at the point of salvation, when we said, "I am going to place my faith in Jesus Christ because He is going to give me eternal life," at that moment, when we placed our faith in Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ did something extraordinary. Um, that old sinful spirit which is inside us, he killed it, literally killed it. He literally uh, crucified it. Okay, so that old sinful nature which was inside you got crucified um, on the cross at a theoretical level. It had, it, I know, it was crucified for everyone. But now, when you make that conscious choice to submit to him and come under his covenant covering, that becomes a reality. So, at that moment, this sinful uh, person, you know, who is living inside this physical container, 
this physical container is like a it's it's a vessel it's a container inside this container was born you know that other uh, you know when we when we were physically born we were born as a sinful spirit so the person inside was a sinful spirit and that sinful spirit was living inside this container physical container the human body so at that moment of salvation christ uh, who has you know positionally crucified each person's uh, sinful nature the free gift of salvation which is being offered through that that becomes a reality so when we accept jesus christ as lord and savior in that moment jesus christ crucifies that old sinful person who is under the control of sin that person even even though they want to live a righteous life they cannot because they are helpless slaves that person gets killed off so what happens in that moment what is left inside this physical container is there a vacuum inside is is it like all empty inside no in that very moment even as that old sinful person gets chopped off killed crucified in that very moment the holy spirit himself gives birth to a brand new person a new creation which is what you know second corinthians 5:17 talks about so in that moment of salvation that old person gets crucified gets kicked out and you have a new creation who is literally been birthed by the holy spirit and so now that person is a new creation a child of god literally with the dna of god inside him okay so you have this new creation which immediately at that moment begins to inhabit this sinful body so the mind is still unrenewed it still has its own sinful thoughts and sinful patterns now you as a believer believer have to start giving it a training program you open the scriptures you teach it the teach it the scriptures you teach it to think in line with scripture so you slowly start working on your unrenewed mind your physical body is still the same body it has not undergone any change so uh, it it is still influenced by sin okay so all those things are are still remaining but you are now this new person you know you're a born again person so now you're going to you know bring this flesh under control so that it does not go on listening to the sinful urges of the flesh and you bring your mind under control and say start aligning yourself with scripture stop thinking the way you used to think before so you are doing that so in that sense uh you choose to crucify the desires and passions of the flesh okay is what it says over here in your galatians chapter 5 verse 24 so um galatians 5 24 paul again refers uh, to it at the end of his letter where he says i have been crucified to the world the world has been crucified to me and he says you know i am a new creation so he brings out this you know uh, at the end of his letter so i just wanted to touch upon that uh, because uh, um, there's this very important you know thing being talked about over here so if you are choosing to abide in christ daily if you are choosing to um, walk in step with the spirit then this is a thing which will happen on a daily basis you take your passions and your desires and you nail them to the cross every day and you say no 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 i'm not going to live like that anymore because i know who i am now i am a new creation i'm no longer under the control of sin that poor fellow who was like under the control of sin died got crucified got kicked out i am now a brand new person literally birthed by the holy spirit with god's dna inside me so you know you um, uh, and of course we have scriptures to back up all of that we'll not get into that whole thing because that would take a long time let's quickly move on into galatians chapter 6 um so you know we people who are supposed to be a new creation this is how we are supposed to be living this is how we are supposed to be behaving in chapter 6 chapter 6 explains to us how we the new creation should be living and behaving uh, so if someone could read out verses 1 uh, 2 maybe um 1 4 5 maybe up to 5 okay Uh, if someone could read out galatians chapter 6 verses 1 to 5 galatians chapter 6 1 to 5 yeah. brothers and sisters if someone is caught in a sin you who live by the spirit should restore that person gently 
but watch yourselves, or you also may be tempted. Carry each other's burdens, and in this way you will fulfill the law of Christ. If anyone thinks they are something when they are not, they deceive themselves. Each one should test their own actions. Then they can take pride in themselves alone without comparing themselves to someone else. For each one should carry their own load. Nevertheless, the one... Yeah. Who... Oh, okay, sorry. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, because that again uh, brings in one more new thought. Uh, so let's first handle this and then we'll move into the next verse. Uh, so here, Paul is saying two things, and a lot of people have a lot of trouble you know, understanding what he is trying to say, because in verse 2, he says, carry each other's burdens. And then a few verses later, he says, you know, you carry your own load. So are you supposed to carry other people's burdens or not? Uh, you know, so, uh, but uh, if you were to you know, read this in the original Greek, uh, poor Paul is actually using two completely different words. OK, so the word for burden used in verse 2 is completely different from the word that he uses later for the other thing. Um, uh, so he is talking about two separate different things. So again, let's just quickly summarize, because we know we don't have time. Um, um, we are supposed to love each other. Right, that's the commandment. We are supposed to, you know, be care about each other, be there for one another, because that's how a new creation behaves. Uh, you know, where you're no longer selfish and self-centered, but you care about other people. Uh, so, when you see someone who is caught in a sin, you who live by the Spirit should restore that person gently. Okay, so um, it says here that the person was caught in a sin which means you know they very happily were kind of um, um flirting with that sin you know kind of going near it examining it from all directions thinking that if i try it out a little bit nothing will happen to me and the sin caught them it's a trap they didn't realize it and now they are stuck they don't know how to get out okay so they are in that really terrible terrible position and uh, that that is uh, that is not something that they're able to come out of on their own. In such cases, you're not supposed to sit back, you know, and say, ha, look at that person, the way he's living, ha, shameless. You know, thank goodness I'm not like that. That is not supposed to be your attitude. You're supposed to care about what that person is going through and go to them and help them, you know, spiritually to come out of that. So you guide them, you sit with them, you pray with them. Uh, you you know, when, when they are when they are feeling low, you go and you encourage them. You do everything from your side to um, to help them come out of that trap, that sin in which they are caught, because that is a burden that they are carrying, which is too heavy to be endured on their own. The word which is used over there, you know, carry each other's burdens. That is a Greek word. Uh, Baros, Baros, I don't know, I have no clue how to pronounce it. But anyway, that's the word. That word Baros is talking about a burden that is too heavy to bear. It's not something that a person will be able to bear on their own. Okay, it's that kind of a word that is being used over there. That same word is used, you know, in, in uh, 2 Corinthians 1.8. Uh, so if someone could just turn in their Bibles to 2 Corinthians 1.8 and read out, uh, you know, what Paul is saying over there about the, you know, the persecutions that they went through and all of that. Second uh, Corinthians 1, 8. Who shall also confirm you unto the end that you may be blameless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. No, I, unless I have given you the wrong reference. Second Corinthians 1, 8. Is it First Corinthians 1, 8? Um, Yes, ma'am. Sorry, sorry. For we would not, brethren, have you ignorant of our trouble which came to us in Asia, that we were pressed out of measure, above mm -hmm. strength, in so much that we dis despaired even of life. The wording over there, you know, uh, what's that? Um, out of what, what? What out of measure? You know, if you could just repeat that. Pressed. Pressed out of measure. Uh, that word over there, you know, pressed uh, um, uh, out of measure. 
in your NIV, it says under great pressure. And then it goes on to say far beyond our ability to endure. So that word over there for pressure, uh, over there is the word barrows. OK, so it's a burden which is beyond your ability to bear. So this person who is caught in sin over here, he's unable to come out on his own. He's like really stuck over there. You as a believer, fellow believer, should care enough to you know walk with that person and help them. It may take a lot of sacrifice, you know, because it may not be instantaneous. You know, you go over there and you preach and give them one sermon. Uh, that may not be enough. You will have to literally, on a day-to-day -day basis, disciple them, walk with them, encourage them, show the uh, scriptures to them, and you know, show them how to stand on those scriptures. It's going to take a lot of effort. You know, you will have a busy schedule, but it's something that you should have the burden to care about. You know, so carry each other's burdens, and in this way, you will fulfill the law of Christ. So when you are doing this, you know giving your time, investing in others, and helping them with their spiritual burdens, as you're doing that, you will automatically find yourself fulfilling all of the Mosaic law without ever bothering about circumcision and all of that. So is what he says. And then he goes on to make a very, very important point, you know, in connection with what he has been saying. You know, if anyone thinks they are something when they are not, they deceive themselves. So, you know, while you're in the process of helping this poor brother who's like struggling with sin, don't look at him and think, ah, oh, I am not like that. I am wonderful. I am perfect. So don't be foolish enough to think like that. Don't try to think that you're something that you're not. Okay. And he, he goes on to, you know, clarify that further in verse four. He says, each one should test their own actions. Then they can take pride in themselves alone without comparing themselves to someone else. So just because you're helping someone else who is in spiritual need, don't think that you have arrived, that you're perfect. No. Kindly examine your, your actions every day. Are you really walking in line with him? Have you crucified those passions and desires? Are you, you know, walking in step with the spirit? Continue to examine yourself daily. Don't you know deceive yourself and think that you have arrived and only other people are, are going to be needing help. You too may be in the same boat. So continue to examine yourself even as you're helping others. Do that. But at the same time, be cautious about your own self as well. You know, continue to work on yourself. Then you can be you know uh, comfortable and sure and confident that yes, I'm walking with the Lord. Don't bring in comparison. Because when you bring in comparison, you'll always think that you're perfect. You look at that other person who is struggling and you think, oh, I'm not struggling the way they are, so I must be perfect. No. Don't use comparison. Rather, examine yourself in, you know, with the help of the Holy Spirit and let him decide. Let him point out to you what is wrong and what is right. And when you are examining yourself with the Holy Spirit, you can hear the Holy Spirit saying, well done, my child. Accept that. You know, the Lord is saying, you're right now walking in line with me. Good. And if, he, if he's saying that, excellent. You know, be proud about it. Enjoy that. You know, enjoy that, uh, that uh, confirmation which the Holy Spirit is giving you. On the other hand, if he's pointing out something, something that you need to work on, something that you need to correct, humble yourself and submit. So just because you are carrying other people's burdens and helping them in their walk, don't start assuming that you are perfect because you are not. In fact, we know, right, even Paul himself, amazing man that he was, uh, who has written 28% of the New Testament, you know, uh, he himself never considered himself perfect. In Philippians chapter 3, verse 12, he says, not that I have already obtained all this or have already arrived at my goal, but I press on. So even he understood that he has not arrived. So when he himself is you know, saying that, we should all be aware that even though we may have grown spiritually to an extent where we can start helping other people you know, in their walk, at the same time, we better continue examining our own actions you know, in the light of the Holy Spirit. Because he may still be pointing out many, many things to us you know, which need um, correction. So we need to be aware of that aspect uh, you know, 
and then so then he goes on to say in the light of what he has just said he said each one should carry their own load okay so we all have a spiritual responsibility a spiritual load to examine ourselves daily to make sure that we are being in step with the spirit uh, this is something that we cannot just push off and say oh the angels will make me holy god will make me holy no this is a load this is the responsibility that you are meant to shoulder someone else is not going to do it for you you got to examine yourself you got to keep yourself in step with him you got to be led by him to be led by him you should be able to hear him right which means you should be keeping your ears open you should be keeping your spiritual ears open clean them every day so that you are able to continue hearing him these are all things which this is all your load this is your responsibility and the word over here used over here is not that other terrible word you know which is like a burden ane which you cannot even bear to uh, to to lift okay that's that needs assistance you need two three people to lift that uh, but here this is a load which can be handled by one person the word used over here is fortion okay the, that's the uh, greek word that is used over here this is like that um, let's use an example judges chapter 9 verse 48 if someone could read out judges chapter 9 verse 48 and abimelech uh, got him up to the mount zalum um, zalmon and he and all the people that were with him and abimelech took an axe in his hand and cut down a bow from the trees and took it and took it and laid it on his shoulder okay yeah yeah that, that that's about it he took it up and he laid it on his shoulders he is carrying a load okay it is heavy but it is bearable so it is going to involve a little effort it is going to tire you out but it is something that you can do okay so this is literally that kind of a load okay so a uh, fortion is is a spiritual responsibility a spiritual load that has been placed on you to make sure that you are being led that you are walking in step with the with with, with the spirit so you um, cannot be casual about your spiritual walk you must take this responsibility this load seriously and carry it on your own nobody somebody else is not going to do that for you okay so that's the point which is being made over here and then he again say adds one more uh, extra thought to that which would be verse 6 so galatians chapter 6 verse 6 if someone could read out Let the one who has taught the word share all good things with the one who teaches. Okay, so here uh, he is saying, so yes, you have your own spiritual uh, load. You have a responsibility that you must carry by yourself. Now, however, this doesn't mean that you know you should act superior and say, oh, I can manage by myself. I don't need anyone else. Uh, this is a walk which I can walk on my own. there are people who are mentoring you there are people who you know who are teaching you and and you know guiding you uh, there are people you know who are investing their lives into you be grateful to them show your gratitude to them you know don't act like as if i'm a one man army and i can manage on my own i don't need anybody else so don't have that attitude either so he says you know nevertheless uh, the one who receives instruction in the word should share all good things with their uh, instructor so over here it doesn't really specifically mean your pastors or your teachers it can even be just you know those informal friends who are like mentors to you and who are your you know your encouragers and the other ones you know who do bible study along with you and the other ones who pray with you it can be someone as simple as that so always be aware that there are other people also you know helping you carry your burdens uh you know like in the earlier sense not in the not in the fortion sense so be grateful to them express your gratitude to them by sharing all good things with them so for instance if you're having a you know celebration in your home um, 
you know you invite that person also let them share in your in your in your, in your you know in the in that bounty which has come to you, you know, share share with them so um, in that sense he's saying learn gratitude as well so you are carrying other people's burdens you are helping them in turn someone else is also helping you with your burdens better be grateful towards them is what he says so these are all different aspects of you know showing love to each other so many different different aspects to it uh, and so this is one of those where you show gratitude to those who are you know standing by you and helping you in your spiritual walk so now in verses 7 and 8 he's kind of wrapping up this whole thing that he's been talking about ever since galatians 5 16 Galatians 5.16, he began talking about how the spirit desires one set of things, the flesh desires one set of things. You have to uh, fulfill the desires of the spirit. And you can only do it by walking by the power of the spirit. It's not going to happen by you know following the Mosaic law. All that he began talking about in Galatians 5.16. And you know he carried us through the entire um, you know, teaching. And now he's kind of wrapping it up. Okay, like this, like almost like the conclusion. Uh, and so he says, uh, let's let's look at verses 7, 8, 9, 10. If someone can read out. Be not deceived. God is not mocked for whatsoever a man soweth, that he shall also reap. For for he that soweth to his flesh shall of shall of the flesh reap corruption, but he that soweth to the spirit shall of the spirit reap life everlasting. And All right. Us, yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, yes. Yeah, please go ahead. Yeah, nine and ten. And let us not be weary in well doing, for in due season we shall reap if we faint not. And as we therefore opportunity, let us do good unto all men, especially unto them who are of the household of faith so he is now wrapping up the entire uh, teaching you know which he has been imparting to them so he says and now it's up to you to decide uh, do you want to follow the desires of the spirit or do you want to follow the desires of the flesh now if you follow the desires of the flesh you're going to reap destruction on the other hand if you are walking by the spirit and you know uh, trying to please the spirit and uh, fulfill his desires the spirit's desires if you're trying to uh, do that then you will reap eternal life so he says that is why don't get tired of doing good you know again and again day by day you're sowing and sowing and sowing you're doing what is good you're following the spirit and no reward is coming you look at other believers around you and they seem to be flourishing in every way but you and your family are still struggling don't give up you know is what he's saying don't give up continue to do good because at the proper time at the god appointed time there's going to be such a wonderful reward you know that's going to come to you so he's saying just hold on and continue to do what is good i'm so sorry this um, laptop can't handle 3 hours of transmission uh, so it's kind of failing just give me a moment uh, yeah huh? so he's saying continue to do what is good because at the proper time at the god appointed time you will reap a harvest an amazing reward will come to you so you know continue to do good to all believers in fact do good to all people you know whether the believers or unbelievers but especially you know you have a responsibility towards your own family of fellow believers those who are part of the kingdom of god so he says do that Okay, and so now he comes to the very last concluding remarks, and there are some very, very lovely things mentioned here, but we don't have time, which is very sad. He says, See what large letters I use as I write to you with my own hand. So, this last concluding remarks, you know, no longer is he dictating the letter to someone else and they are writing it in their handwriting. Now he takes the pen and he himself is writing this last few words, and you know, he's like pouring out his heart in these last few words and he's saying you know these people who are trying to impress you that's what he says in verse 12 he says you know uh, those who want to impress people by means of the flesh are trying to compel you to be circumcised 
Now, these guys are not compelling you to get circumcised because they're so concerned about keeping the law. Um, you know, um, in fact, he goes on to say in verse 13, um, yeah, they themselves are not keeping the law. Okay. Right here, they are preaching to you and saying, get circumcised, get circumcised, and they're putting pressure on you, not because they care about the law, because in their personal lives, they are not keeping the law. The reason that they're doing that is because they want more followers. You know, like we have in our modern times and the likes and the dislikes and the number of followers that you have, uh, you know, following you. These people are in that kind of a mode. The reason they're putting pressure on you to get circumcised is because they want more followers. They want to show off how great they are and how many disciples they have. And that's the reason why they are putting pressure on you. Because if you see, when it comes to, you know, standing up for the cross of Christ, they are not nowhere around. You know, they are not willing to take any persecution for the for the cross of Christ. Um, so they are actually fake. Uh, they're only asking you to follow the Mosaic law so that they can go around boasting, saying, how ah, you know what, how this many people I converted. OK, so they, their whole attitude is wrong. On the other hand, what am I boasting about? He says, this is my boast. He says in verse 14, he says, may I never boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, through which the world has been crucified to me and I to the world, he says. So. He is saying, I am only boasting about one thing, what the cross has done for me. That is all I am boasting about. And this is a very, very shocking statement to be making. Uh, you know, over here in his own handwriting, even as he's writing this, he can't even catch what he is saying because for us, the cross is something that we revere and, you know, we look up to it with respect. But in those days, the cross was something very degrading something that you would do only to the worst people. Um, it's such a humiliating thing. And um, you have you know, this Cicero, who was a Roman statesman. He has written these writings of his. And when you read those writings, you know uh, he talks about the cross and crucifixion as something so bad and so humiliating that the Romans, you know, when they're giving a um, a death sentence and saying, no, let this man be crucified by the cross. They don't even use the words because the words are like such bad, they're like dirty words. So rather than saying, you know, let this person be crucified on the cross, they will avoid using those terms. They will instead use the words. Uh, they will say, let him be hung on the unlucky tree because that's a more decent way of putting it rather than using these dirty words, cross and the word crucifixion, because that's something that you do to the to the lowest people in society. So respectable people don't even use those words on their lips. Now, this is not something that we are making up. Cicero, the Roman statesman who lived in those times, actually wrote these things in his writings. OK, so Jesus Christ, when he chose that manner of uh, you know death to die for us, he was literally choosing something that was so derogatory, so cheap. Uh, that people would respectable people would not even refer to the word stavros the greek word for cross they would not use that word stavros they would use other words you know alternatives they would say you know, the, the the tree the, the the wooden stake they would use all those words but they would not use this dirty word because it's, it's a very very unclean word and paul he's saying this is what i'm boasting about I'm not going to boast about uh, the Jewish laws that I'm keeping, the rituals that I'm, I am boasting about Stavros. And very boldly, he writes that word Stavros. He says, this is my boast. Stavros is what I'm proud about. And Stavros has, you know, what it has, what it has done to me, it has crucified me. He's using the other dirty word, you know, which people avoid. He's saying, this is my boast. The, this beautiful Stavros has, you know, crucified me to the world. And the world is crucified to me. And he says, this is what I stand on. So you know, he's like saying to them, you also just embrace the cross. You guys also embrace the cross. Don't go after all this praise that you want glory, you know, and this, uh, this Jewish loss and all that. Hold on to the cross, because that is where your hope is. That is where your eternal life you know, resides. So there's so much beauty in the way you know he ends his letter. And another thing that we just need to remember, this man, Paul, he was a Roman citizen. Don't have the time to get into the details of that, you know, but, you know, he didn't have to buy his Roman citizenship. 
he literally was born a roman citizen so he being a roman citizen is openly talking about stavros and crucifixion and is boasting in that it shows that he couldn't care less about what the romans are thinking he couldn't care less what about the jewish people are thinking he is proud to be who he is his ma lord and master chose to be crucified on a cross and so he's proud to identify himself with his master and say you know what i also belong with this master i too i know i'm crucifying myself on the cross because he crucified me on the cross so you know he's bringing out all of those teachings and so you know he kind of ends by saying um you know what matters is the uh, new creation um so he says neither circumcision nor uncircumcision means anything what counts is the new creation i am a new creation because i have placed my faith in this jesus christ so um you people want to chase after circumcision and all of that you know uh, that's just foolishness but all that really counts is that uh, that faith in jesus christ the faith in this cross of christ because that alone can make you into a new creation that alone can take you into god's presence you know is 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 is, is what he says in these ending concluding thoughts you know there's no time at all left let's just close with a word of prayer thank you so much oh lord for all the beautiful things that we could learn uh, through the letter to the uh, galatians uh, lord we pray that even today uh, we will be people who will be proud uh, to represent ourselves to identify ourselves uh, with the cross that lord we would be willing uh, to undergo this humiliating uh, process of crucifixion Uh, where we choose to say no to what we want where we will be willing to say no to the things which don't please you where we will be willing to nail those things to the cross uh, even though that is something so humiliating and lord we would instead be willing to glorify you to walk in step with you to do what you desire because when we are doing that as we are doing that you will begin to produce your fruit your very nature the very nature of christ and we will start becoming like christ thank you o lord for this amazing uh, promise that you have given us so help us o lord to walk in step with the spirit so that truly we can start becoming like jesus christ our lord and master enable us o lord for this thank you lord in jesus name we pray amen Amen. Thank you so much. So we'll uh, meet again next week, and we will begin Ephesians. Thank you, Pastor. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, Pastor. God bless you. Thank you.